some of you online know this is the part where Josh says, it's that time in the program, but <laughs> for, the mess- next, for the main message. <laughs> I won't go all of what Josh goes through, the spiel. But, <laughs> uh, but again, welcome. And uh, again, I know it's like the third time, but happy Sabbath, really happy Sabbath. And uh, I'm glad everybody's here in the room, in the building. And those online, welcome, and just glad you're with us, and God's Spirit's with us, and He's watching down, He's protecting us, and our Savior's there, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful day every week on the Sabbath. I can't believe it's here again, it's July 8th, and the 4th of July is gone, and gone by another, so just, whew. Last week, I know those online, in the room you didn't hear me talk, but last week online we talked about liberty and freedom from God as we were looking towards July 4th. And as on the back side of July 4th, um, we're going to make a continuation of that, just a little bit of liberty and freedom, but to see some more details of how do we get that liberty and freedom from God and what we, what we are asked to do and told to do, actually, told to do, commanded to do. But as we do this, you know, it's kind of hard this past 4th of July, and I heard the question several times on interviews or on TV or commentaries. I was like, why are we celebrating you know, this 4th of July and the chaos and the chaos that we see? In the, and we do see a lot of chaos. And it's, you know, you think about, and I was on the island, Mackinac Island, of course, for those who have been there, or if you have not been there, you've heard about the island, it's a, it's a step back in time. And there's no automobiles, no cars. <laughs> we came back on Thursday and First thing you heard was a motorcycle roaring by our house. You go, we didn't miss that the past few days. Uh, There's horses and bicycles, and and it's just back in time. And I'm sitting there in the fort and just thinking what it was like. The fort there on Mackinac Island celebrated the fourth as as it if it was the year 1880, and they had the the reenactors come out and salute the 38 states at that time with a 38 gun salute. And uh, they came out and they actually read the entire the cap the captain of the divi- of the of the soldiers there came out and read the Declaration of Independence out loud to the crowd, as they used to do. And I sat there and thought, man. And I know I said this last week in the message, man, we are so far gone from <laughs> those kind of days of celebrating and being thankful of what God did on that Fourth of July. Soma in 1776. But we see this chaos happening. And why is this chaos happening? Well, I guess a real simple answer is it's the lack of keeping law. Law is laughed at, not kept. Law is different for different people now. We have two tiers of laws or two tiers of justice. These people can burn and loot, and these people, if they're if they're just calmly sitting on a ground reading the Bible, get arrested and get dragged off. It's chaos. It's lack, like I said, lack lack of keeping the law. But it's not just law of man, it's the law of God. The lack of understanding God's simple laws and statutes. Lawlessness abounds. Now, we talk about man's law. I like law. I, I hope that you like law. I always use this example. I've well, I use it before. I've used it before. Do you like the law that says at a stop sign you should stop? I like that law. You know, somebody ignores that stop sign and blows through, could, could cause an accident, could cause injury, could cause death. Do you like the law? I like the law coming down here today that the law that we've made as man as you stay on the right side of the road in this country. On that side of the yellow line, I like that law. It's a nice law. If somebody ignores that law or does something to break that law, then you might you're going to have an accident, have injury, could have death. That's a good law. And we could do the what if all day. We could do the what if. What if about this law? This law. We like this law. We could do this all day. But the point is that law is there to protect order, and in turn protect people and to give them liberty. That's what law is there for. When there is law and it is kept, then we have the liberty to live and to pursue happiness. If that laws and you know we keep those laws, I'm going to read something from John Adams in a moment. But 
we keep those laws. Those laws are there to give us liberty and to pursue hap- our own happiness. We follow the law. This is biblical to the core. James 1, verse 25. James 1, verse 25. Let's turn to James 1. James 1, verse 25 says, But uh, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Of course, James is talking about God's laws, God's commandments, God's statutes, what God lays down. Looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. What law of liberty? Well, it's the commandments. It's the statutes. Exodus 20 outlines this. The Ten Commandments. Exodus 20. Exodus 21, verses 1 through 17 are the Ten Commandments that he gave Israel. At this moment, I'm not going to read through all of them. I want to read through them in a few minutes. But it's the Ten Commandments that God laid down. The first four, how to deal with and worship God and love God. And the back back sixth, five through ten, how to deal with man, family members, mankind, friends. The Ten Commandments. But we'll read those in a few minutes. And we'll come back to them. See, the law of Almighty God is part of his covenant with his people. And as I brought up last week in the message last week of who we are, we are Ephraim. This country is Ephraim. Israel, Jacob placed his name on Ephraim. And under that covenant with God, we are to keep those laws. Law is important to God. Normally, I'm going to read two quotes. I'm going to read two quotes. Usually I save this for Constitution Day, September 17th, but as I found out last week when I was looking at the calendar, that's the day right after, day, right after the Feast of Trumpets. I don't know what we're going to speak about in the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets, September 16th. Constitution Day, September 17th. But just two from two former presidents. The first is James Madison. He was there when the Constitution, our laws, were being built. Our Constitution was being designed. James Madison said it is impossible for the pious man not to recognize in the Constitution a finger of that almighty hand which was frequently extended to us in the critical stages of the evolution, of the revolution, excuse me, of the revolution. No people ought to feel greater obligations to celebrate the goodness of the great disposer of events and the destiny of nations than the people of the United States. And to the same divine author of every good and perfect gift, we are indebted for all those privileges and advantages, religious as well as civil, which are so richly enjoyed in this favored land. And that was soon to be, he wasn't president yet, but James Madison, he would become president of the United States. And John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. It is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. That's why we're seeing the chaos that we're seeing. That's why not only this year, but last year, five years ago, ten years ago, it's building up, it's been building up as we get closer and closer to our enemy, knowing his time is short. Because our laws... We're only made for a moral and religious people. If people don't have morals and don't care, they're going to make the decision to cross the yellow line. Or they'll make the decision to go blow through that red stop sign. They might look and say, well, no, there's no police officer around. Who's going to stop me from doing it? John Adams hit it on the head. And that's the way of the commandments. If, you're, if we are not moral, don't have morals, and we're not religious, religious in the sense that we obey God and listen to God, we have no use for the Ten Commandments. What are they? He hit it on the head. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. 
and it's almost a prophecy, it is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. As you see the lies and the deceit and just all the nastiness that's happening. Now, again, not just now. It's been happening for years. And we see. God's own word tells us that we will be successful and fruitful by studying and meditating on the law. But first, we have to understand what it means to break the law. That's what's happening in this country. This is what's happening in this nation. The laws of God are being ignored, are being broken, are you know, thumb, you know, thumb on nose to God. 1 John 3, verse 4. First John 3, verse 4. And I'm reading from the New King, the New King James. And the New King James says in 1 John 3, 4, says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And the King James Version is, says, Sin is the transgression of the law. That is sin. The world doesn't know what sin is. It's been deceived. And again, I say this almost every time when the topic comes up, to make sure we all understand that Satan is deceiving the world. Our enemy is being allowed to go as far as God allows him to go. We know that from the book of Job. But it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. As, as we get closer to the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as the scripture tells us, is going to happen. Sin is the transgression of God's law. Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1 verse 4 says, Alas, sinful nation. Alas, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. In Isaiah, it's called out. A sinful nation breaking the laws of God, not keeping the laws of God, not keeping his statutes. And if they do sin, they don't repent of it. They don't ask for forgiveness as we have been taught to do because we don't keep the law perfectly we don't a magic wand didn't happen when we were baptized and the Holy Spirit went on us oh guess what you'll never sin again that's, that's a myth that doesn't happen we still sin we still break the law but we know that to, to get better we come before God and repent and say we're sorry I'm sorry please help me the nation is not doing that. Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. One of two chapters that goes through the blessings and cursings of keeping God's laws. The other one is Deuteronomy 28. I'm not going to Deuteronomy 28. I'm not going to read all of this chapter. I invite you, though, what I don't read, please read. Give you a little homework assignment. I am a teacher, but it's, you know, summer break, summer break, you know, but I still give you a homework assignment. <laughs> so Leviticus 26, verse 1. Blessings for obedience, verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. The fourth commandment is the weekly Sabbath. But he also tells us in his statutes and his other teachings that we keep all his Sabbaths. And that's plural, my Sabbaths. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, I will give you rain in season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in the land safely. 
I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. See, I can see this happening in 1620, in 1776. At the beginning of this country, the blessings. Not that they kept them perfect either. There were Sunday keepers back then. There was, I'm just saying. The blessings that God made to Abraham. These blessings. If you do and you reverence me and you don't worship any other gods but me, I will bless you. But verse 14, I know there's more there in the blessings. And again, I said I was just going to read a few. But for the punishment for disobedience, he says in verse 14, but if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments and you despise my statutes... And if, or if your soul abhors my judgments so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant. He, he lays out commandments, statutes, and the covenant. If you break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And I know that Tom and his messages and his NNIs have gone over these next few scriptures of seven times and seven times and seven times. That's God holds us dear to himself. I'm going to go to verse 23. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. In verse 26, when I've cut off your supply of bread. That's what Tom talked about yesterday, those nuggets and insights. The food shortages. And that's, that's been happening now for years now because of the war in Ukraine and other things and the mind-boggling decisions to slaughter cows for no apparent reason in the world. But And you shall eat and not be satisfied. Oh, it says, Ten women shall bake your bread in one oven and they shall bring back your bread by weight and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chasten, chastise you seven times for your sins. And it continues on. And it says later on, he says in verse 40, But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember. I will remember the land. The land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. See, his mercy. For I am the Lord their God. For, but for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. And these are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So read all of that. Read Deuteronomy 28 too, if you're not familiar with those. But he takes this seriously. The covenant which is the commandments are part of that covenant. He takes seriously. 
you know. We can read, you know, and now we read, you know, not read, sorry, now we hear, hear everything, you know, the smoke that we had in Canada, we were up in Michigan and things, some Ohio, not this past week, but the week before, and we're choking on smoke from Canada. But they call it climate change. It's not climate change. As a scientist myself, my background is science, climate change is not happening. There's the non-God answer. The godly answer is this, because of the sins of the nation. If you read Deuteronomy 28, it talks about cities being on fire. And obviously he said, you know, if you read this, no rain. But the world's been deceived to worship the, crea the created instead of the creator. And when the, con the punishments come down, the consequences come down, oh, it's climate change. It is the curses from these chapters coming to fruition. When God is removed, when his truth is removed, when his words are not heeded, the results can be seen. We see this in ancient Israel, in the book of Judges. Judges 17. So history again is repeating itself. The same things that happened to ancient Israel are happening to modern day Israel. That would be the United States of America and the tribe of Judah over across there in the Middle East, the nation that we call Israel. And Great Britain, too. But Judges 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So they had to send a judge. God sent a judge to help them out. Judges 21, verse 25. Again, he repeats in Judges 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes eyes. Time and again, time and again, God's had to send judges to save Israel because they forgot the truth. They went back backsliding in the law. They forgot the law time and time again. Judges chapter 2 verse 7 so this is after Joshua's death. And he told them, you go to the book of Joshua, he told them, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the Lord thy God? He says, yes. They said, yes, we will serve God. Yes, we will. And Joshua actually said, if you go and read it, Joshua actually doubts that they can do it. Judges 2, verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timoth Harris, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. They forgot their history. That's what this country has done, is choosing to forget their history of God's hand upon this country. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed the other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. We see history repeating itself, with the forsaking of God and his laws and his statutes. The kings of it, it continued, even after when they got kings. You can read the book of Judges, and you see, because it says, 
In the next verse, verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. God's mercy still loved his people, love his people, love his creation. And his mercy is forever, as the book of Psalms tells us. But this is what happens when his law is forsaken and his law is not kept. History repeats itself. We can even see, we pick a king. Let's pick a king. Second King 16. Let's just pick one king. Let's just pick one. Second Kings 16. Second Kings 16, verse 1. In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Now, side note, I've said this before. Read through the entire kings of Israel after Solomon. Not one good one. Not one. Not the kings of Israel. Remember the tribe? They split in two. The kings of Israel, kings of Judah. Not one good king of Israel. Not one. Judah had ups and downs. And this is one of the downs. Ahaz. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire. It means he sacrificed his son to Chemosh, to Baal. He killed his own child. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel, and he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. I'm not going to continue. You can read about Ahaz, and you can actually read about continue on. You know, the kings. It's very, king, books of, the books of kings and chronicles are great reads to see that history is repeating itself in this day and age. We are to meditate. He didn't do. He didn't listen to the law. He didn't follow. Which law? The first few commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Thou shalt not murder He thought he was doing it right in his own eyes. Joshua 1, verse 7 says, Joshua 1, verse 7, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And he says in verse 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's based on what verse 8 says. Verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it day, in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. That's a promise from God. As a promise, both a physical and a spiritual promise, and much more spiritual for us. We get closer to God. We get to learn and understand. We work on what we need to work on. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Just as a reminder. Psalm chapter 1. There. Verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the winds drive away. Therefore the ungodly, ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. 
It's meditation. Meditation. Meditate on the law. It's delight. It's joyful. It's not a burden. Keeping law gives us freedom. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. One hundred five, verse one hundred five. Psalm one hundred nineteen, verse one hundred five says, "Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path." Without His word, without His laws, without His statutes, we will lose our way. Well, Exhibit A is the world. They've lost their way. They're deceived. They're, they're being deceived. They don't understand. He says in 106, I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I, have, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, I pray, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. I have not, I do not forget your law. Verse 113 says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up, and I shall be safe, and I shall observe your statutes continually. See, God promises. God promises if you listen to me, you worship me, you let me tell you how to live, you will do well. Again, like I said, it's not a magic potion. We still go through things. But especially now in our day and age, we look forward to the kingdom. He's looking for faithful servants. That's what Christ says. He's Christ, our Savior, said, Who, when I return, will I say, good and faithful servant? Who will I find? Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, verse 5 and 6. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are des desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. And as the book of Revelation shows us, the seals happening, will be happening, are opening or could be opening, will be opening soon. That's what's happening because the law is being broken. Romans 8 tells us the whole earth is groaning for the revelation of the sons of, men, sons of God. Sorry, the sons of God. The family of God. That reward that Christ has with him when he returns so the healing can begin. Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5. And, and I know the world is deceived. They don't want to hear this. The world hears this message. This is for us to remind us. And it's to give us inspiration to keep doing what we're doing. To keep the commandments. To keep the laws. Even if it's by, by the world's judgments, if that gets us in trouble, so be it. We'd rather answer to God than to men. If the world would hear these words and repent and the nation. Deuteronomy 5, once, Deuteronomy 5 is the Ten Commandments again. Deuteronomy 5, 
And Moses has call, called all Israel and said, Come to them, hear, O Israel, verse 1, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in, or, in Horeb. A covenant again. And he made, it says, The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. So he made another covenant with the people of Israel. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire. You did not go up the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And we see in this day and age that this world has clung and seeked, sought other gods. Whether it's worshiping nature, worshiping self, worshiping human beings, you know, self. Doing what's right in their own eyes because man thinks they're, they themselves are God and not God himself. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, anything likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to keep to those who love me and keep my commandments. Any image, any image, and I'm not going to go dissect the world right now. But any image in any building, in any place, thing, whatever, that people bow down and worship is a graven image. If they put any image before God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that is breaking the second commandment. Anything. Anything. Ancient Israel got in trouble because they were building bulls and calves and altars to Chemosh and Baal. Modern day Israel, well, how do we get in trouble? Images. Things that people bow down and worship that put, they put before God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God's name is special. He told Moses, I am who I am. Tell him, I am has sent you. His name should be revered and not used in daily language. And again, I'm not going to dissect the world right now, but we hear it. We, we know it. We've been in places where we hear it. And it, should, it irks me. It's like you know, in the olden days of teaching, it's like the, chalk on, the fingernails on a chalkboard. When we hear people say or take the Lord's name in vain and don't give the Lord God, God and or Jesus Christ, both of their dues, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. That your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out there from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. That day is today, the seventh day of the week. And that commandment is being broken every week by millions and millions and billions of people. That is being broken. I'm not going to go through the history of it. We can do that another time. But listen to this, make a point. That commandment is being broken every week. 
by billions and billions and billions of people. They broke it when the forefathers were here. They did. I mentioned that earlier in the message. They weren't perfect. Some, some of the communities did try to keep the seventh day Sabbath. There's history on that in New England. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. It's fascinating that he put that one next because as we make the transition of honoring our Father in heaven and our brother, Jesus Christ, we go now the transition to how we treat each other on this planet. And it's honor your father and your mother, your physical father and your mother. And sometimes that can be hard because family life, you know, I, I'm not giving an excuse. We, I see that as a teacher a lot. The students are just mouthy to parents. You can see it in the world. We see it on the news. We see it. We see it. Honor your father and your mother as your Lord, as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not murder. Well, that happens on a daily, that one gets broken on a daily basis. And it has for his, in, in, throughout history, that one's been broken. That one's been broken. You shall not commit adultery. You should not commit adultery. We see that broken all the time. Our Savior Jesus Christ, when he raised up, said to even look at a woman in a lustful way is committing adultery. I could have talked about the murder one too because in the same scripture in Matthew, the Christ said even to think in your head that you want to harm your brother, you're a murderer. To even lust after a woman, he said, in your mind. The secret places. Now they just do it out in the open. And that's been going on for years. Centuries. History has but this. Commit adultery. Sexual sin has been going on. Now it's just raised its ugly head to unknown levels. Because if we go back and read Leviticus 18, 19, and 20. You know, those are not the commandments, but those are his statutes where it talks about sexual, uh, the right ways to have sexual practice. I'm not going to get into a you know, lesson of uh, sexuality here. But Le Leviticus 18, 19, and 20. He states, don't lie man with man. Woman with woman. Don't dress like, if you're a man, don't dress like a woman. If you're a woman, don't be like a man. God covers it. And some people say, well, it's not in the commandments. What's the first one say? You shall not have any other gods before you. We hold these, we hold these dearly to us. This is why we will be hated. I have been hated. Continue to be hated. <laughs> these are our guideposts. You shall not steal. Well, that one's broken a lot, too. Just look in the country. I, I'm doing this, just get us to think, like, yeah, this has been going on for a long time. It's just the ugliness in the past couple year, months, whatever, has reared, reared itself to un, unbelievable levels. And just like history showed us with Israel and Judah, it's going to get to the point. Where God said, enough's enough. But praise God this time, when enough's enough, he will send his son. He will send his son. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. You shall not be deceitful against your neighbor. You not lie to people near you. Oh, that. <laughs> I don't know, enough said. 
We've got hidden things going on around us, lies, deceitfulness, cover-ups. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Do not covet. Be happy with what you have. Be happy with what the blessing of the Lord God has given us. Me, you, be happy. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more, and he wrote them on the two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And it's Moses talking. The commandments. We see them being broken, and we see what's happening because of those breaking of those commandments. We see the fires, we see the droughts, we see the hurricanes, we see the storms, we see what, you know, the derecho. I knew that Tom was going to talk about that yesterday because as a science person, I like watching the weather. And I saw the news about the derecho that came across the United States and said, here we go. Now we got clouds of dust coming over from Africa across the Atlantic to block and to mess up Florida and the Caribbean and as far west as Texas. I said, my goodness. He thought the smoke was bad enough. Now we got dust coming over from Africa. This was happening this weekend. The mindset of the world has spiraled to the immoral. It has. The mindset. Satan has been allowed to be in control. He is the God of this age, the God of this world. But even with this going on, we are, to, we are to listen to God. We are to obey God. We are to continue the journey that we have been commissioned to travel, even in the midst of the chaos and sitting in, in a, a sinful nation. We are to keep moving forward. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. And all who want to repent of their sins are welcome to God's way. Not my way, not Tom's way, not Steve's way, not Bruce's way, not your way. It's God's way. God's truth. 2 Peter 3, verse 11. Second Peter 3, verse 11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved... What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's it's called integrity. It's called, I'm going to do the right thing no matter who's watching me. Ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We pray for that. We pray for that. That's his promise. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him, by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them in all things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. They will twist things. Satan's been allowed to twist, lie, deceive. Not only God's scriptures, we see now, you know, we can see it in our country, our nation, a document, the Constitution, our laws are being twisted. Deceived about, lied about. God's laws are higher, but they're, and his words are being twisted. God sets up so many things. I mentioned last week, God set up this country so that his truth and word go forth and be preached. Our first amendment to the Constitution. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion. So we can sit in the building that we sit, those that sit and listen, wherever they are sitting on this day, to hear. We have that right still. 
We still have the right to go forth and be who God asks us to be and tells us to be, to believe his word and to be the light. His obedience, we obey his laws. It's not a weakness, but it's a strength. It's a strength by keeping the law. It's not a weakness. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Going back there. But in verse 18. First John 3 verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. That Spirit, that Holy Spirit that we received at baptism helps us if we allow it to help us. It's a piece of the Father. John wrote this. It's amazing. John wrote his gospel. And that, that, that gospel, we read those chapters on the night of the Lord's Supper where Christ say, says, abide in me, I will abide in you. Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. God wants us to be successful. His people to be successful. 1 John 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. It's not burdensome. They're not at all. We've heard the argument before. I've heard it years past. Oh, they're just hard to keep. No. They're, they're not hard to keep. We can choose not to keep them, and we can choose in situations to break them, and we can. We've done, humans, we've done it. We've all broken the commandments. We've sinned. I mean, we're not perfect in this room or online. We're not perfect. When he says, thou shalt not murder, I don't know. I find it easy not to go murder somebody. Of course, you think it in your head, though. He, you know, he raised it up. You, you know, so you got to be careful. You got to be careful because, like I said, Christ did raise it to a spiritual plane. He did raise it up. And speaking of the Gospel of John, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 31. John 8, verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. And that's when they got in the whole conversation, like, who is this guy? Who is he? And he finally tells him, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. The truth, God's truth, will make you free. Then he says in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Most surely I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And that's why he died. It's one of the, you know, his blood... The mercy. We can repent of our sins and we can be free 
and have liberty. But if we sin, then we're slaves to sin again. And you break the law. Second Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians 10 verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So when we obey God, we put away that disobedience. Yes, it does say captivity, but I'd rather be captive to obedience and to God. Because we do belong to him, those who have been baptized and have the Holy Spirit. We belong to him. We are his. Scriptures tells us that. The obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 13. Second Corinthians 13, verse 5. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do, not, you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, that, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. For, when, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And he's talk, that's Paul talking to the church in Corinth, about him and the people with Paul and about the church in Corinth. He said, test yourselves. Examine yourselves. Make sure Christ is in you. The truth. Strive to have Christ in us. He was a law keeper. He kept the law. He kept the law. We need to remember who we are and be close to God and to Jesus Christ. And remind ourselves that our Savior loves us. Our Father in heaven loves us. And wants us to continue. Yeah, the world's a mess. The world's a hot mess. It says, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 it was going to be a hot mess. Peter writes about it in 2 Peter chapter 2. It's going to be a hot mess. It's going to despise authority. We see that. We see that. What authority? Two rules of justice. We see that happening. We see parades. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but maybe you've seen it. We see parades where people are riding bikes naked. Uh, normally, that would be time to go to jail. That's indecent exposure. Not anymore. As we're coming close to wrapping up today, Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Verse 1. My son, do not forget my law. But let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Because what did our Savior say? You be that light. You do those works. You do those good works. And and the men around you will give glory to God because of your good works. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. See, that's what got ancient Israel in trouble. Remember we read that? They thought they were doing it right in their own eyes. That's what's happening today. It's been happening for a while. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. That's what God says. 
Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor distest his correction. Yeah, sometimes we need to be corrected. That's okay. Sometimes we do lose sight, and we forget, and we sin, and sometimes we need to be corrected. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Just, it's all part of his mercy as we wrap up today. God's mercy. By his scripture, we know he hates what's going on in this world. We know, we know that, but he's allowed it to happen. And he has a plan, a salvation plan for the world. We just, for whatever reason, each one of us got a little preview and we've accepted the calling and we know that we keep the course and we hold strong to the truths that we've talked about today, the truths of the commandments and the statutes of God. We will find our way. We can't buy our own. We can't buy it. We, can never, we never could. By just keeping the law, we're not, we don't have a free pass. It's by his grace and his love. But he wants to know who that faithful servant is. Because we are to be rulers with our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the kingdom. We're going to be tasked to do jobs, to continue to obey, and to show that obedience to those who come out of the tribulation after this time frame goes by. That's the beauty of the kingdom's coming. The kingdom is coming. And God will send his Son to fix the problems and to help us. He continues to help us, but to send the Calvary to hold so we can hold fast. Second Peter 3, verse... I think I read that already, Second Peter 3, verse... And I think I have it in there twice. I don't think I catch it. We'll see if I read it. I did it twice. It's okay. Nope. I didn't read it. It was the other part of chapter 3 I read. Second Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's part of his plan. They all will one day. If they choose to, there's still going to be some that won't. Second Chronicles 7. Let's go back to the book of Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14, he says here, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I don't think the nation will do that, but people can. People, if God calls them and they make the choice to repent and call upon him. He has mercy. John 8, go back to John 8. I know we were there earlier. John 8. At the beginning of the chapter, we have the story of the adulteress that was thrown in front of Jesus. She's committing adultery. She committed adultery. She broke the Ten Commandments. What do you say? He told them, he who was without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. He wasn't condoning the sin. She sinned. I said a couple weeks ago, the message I gave was, where's the guy that did it with her? It takes two to commit adultery. I almost wonder if it's one of the gentlemen that threw her in front of Jesus, but that's... Two-tier two -tier system? I don't know. But he said, who was without sin among you? Throw the first stone at her. They all dropped their stones and walked away. And he said in verse 9, and saw no one but the woman, because he looked up. He said to her, woman, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We all sin. 
we screw up, we mess up. But the, the point is, Christ's saying, don't do it again. Don't sin no more. Make it a point to be better. Broke the law. Yep, yeah, she broke the law. We all break the law. But sin no more, he said. The mercy, he's going to be coming, he's coming again and wipe away the tears and bind up our enemy for a thousand years so he can't whisper in the ears. First Samuel 1, as we come to a close today, First Samuel 1. See, this has been going on for centuries, for history, for uh, history, years. I think, oh, 1 Samuel 12. I think I said 1 Samuel 1, so I apologize. I forgot the 2 was next to the 1 in number 12. 1 Samuel 12. And this is Samuel giving his final address. He's leaving. He's going to walk off and be done with what he does, be prophet and priest. And... He talks about the wickedness. He talks about sending a king over them. And he says in verse 13, now, therefore, here's the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired and take note. The Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your father's. And it says in verse 20, Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear, you have done all this wickedness, yet, you, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the, people will not forsake his pe for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. We are God's people. He loves us, and he loves all his creation, don't you know? But as we are in the spiritual part of this now, as we're looking forward to the kingdom, let's continue to obey God, listen to God, be corrected by God. And he says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. So as we close, think of all the great things God has done for you in your life. He has brought us this far, and he will continue to get us where we need to be as long as we listen and obey and keep his commandments and his statutes. Praise God for that. We know we live in a sinful nation. We know what's happening out there. God is allowing it to happen. But we have been given the choice, we've been given the knowledge to continue to follow him and obey him. And we look forward to the day that Christ returns and we can just fix this entire mess.